Stand up. You can't really see the whole thing up there, can we? Yes, okay. Welcome to uh, Six Man. Well, I'm pushing the beginning. That's me. Hold on. What are you going to do to that? There we go, that's better. Welcome to Six Man. Still getting used to the new Meet Echo interface. Um, this is Jen, this is Oli. Um, next slide. This is the note well. We assume you have memorized this from all the previous IETF sessions by now, so we won't go over it. Next slide. Um, and these are some hints for how to use Meet Echo. You should be running the, the um, in-room version to um, add yourself to the queue if you want to speak, because um, we'll be managing the queue from both local and remote presenters. Next slide. Um, oh yeah, so the important thing is we need a minute taker. Did we need someone to volunteer to take minutes? And we'll see if we can just keep asking until someone volunteers. Start with the prompt. Jordi, do you want to take minutes? Is that a positive yes? Yeah. I think she said yes, right? No, he, he, he. we're moving along. You know, we'll continue to look at you hard until someone accepts to take minutes. Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Now we can proceed. Okay, next slide. So uh, this is the agenda. We have a set of working group documents um, and then uh, active internet drafts. Um, the one agenda change is that uh, since there weren't any more comments about the hop by hop processing draft, we will, there will not be a presentation for that today. So we have more time for the other talks or get done sooner. Next slide. Uh, and these are the active individual drafts. Um, any comments on the agenda or agenda changes? Okay, uh, next slide. So we'll go through document status. Um, so we've not, no new uh, RFCs have been published um, or any, or no new, no documents are in the RFC queue since the last ITF. We have two documents we've submitted to the ISG. Um, the one th that's been there the longest is the RFC 6874 BIS. And this is currently has two discusses and um, Eric is um, working to try to find some resolution for that. Um, we seem to have come to somewhat of an impasse, I think. Um, it was interesting to attend the working group chair session where people talked about discuss process in the ISG, but I resisted coming to the mic. Um, we also have um, segment identifiers, which has recently been submitted to the ISG and is, um, I think the status, I think there's a... a yeah, I think there's an I in a change, so there'll be a new ID coming. Suresh? Uh, is there a discussion I couldn't sign on yet? 
Uh, yeah, so there's like two uh, director reviews and one INR request. And I um, put the changes into the draft. I'll submit as soon as the uh, AD asked me to. Okay. okay, good. Which I think he probably just did. So, yeah. But I, I, I would be surprised if this takes a lot of time to get through the ISG, but we'll see what happens. Um, we have one document that is completed working group last call, the hop to hop processing document. And I think that's now waiting for the chairs right up and then, then it'll get to Eric. Okay, next slide. Um, and in working group last call, we have the extension header limit draft and um, the chairs did one review and then a review of the updated document, which was sent out very recently. Um, Tom will be talking later about it later today, but I, I think this will take a bit more time, but I think we're making good progress. We, we're very pleased to see a lot of improvements in the current draft. Um, in adoption call, we have the CRH draft um, and so I think the adoption call ends early next week. Uh, on Monday, Monday, like midnight. Okay. So if you haven't commented or expressed your opinion on the adoption call, please do. Um, we have um, four working group documents that are, you know, not listed anywhere else on these slides. The, um, IOM conference date, the 6724 update, VPN, BTN IDs, uh, IPv6 over wireless. Next slide. Um, now, this, when I was working on these slides on the data tracker, it lists expired working group documents. And one of these, uh, the first one, the Slack renumbering expired very recently. And I, I suspect we will get an update to that pretty soon. But some of the others, especially the, the last one here that I'm the author of, which is back from 2007. So what is that? Um, that's a long time ago. So, um, my proposal for the working group on these is there's a state uh, we can call them work, working group uh, documents that are dead or something like that. So I'll send them something out to the list or we'll send something out to the list, but I think we propose, except for the first, first one in the list, these should all be marked as dead because I don't think they're going to progress any further. Actually, one of them seemed to be called IPv6 hop by hop extension header handling. So I, I guess you can mark it as replaced by Strictly speaking. Yes, we could. Okay. Um, one thing that we noticed here is there doesn't seem to be a way in the data tracker, data tracker to make them not a working group document. Yeah, at least not that I could find. So it seems like a, it seems like something the tooling should support. So, who's in the queue? Tom. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, 2007 is a pretty long time ago. I thought there was uh, some sort of policy that if a working group document doesn't get any activity for a year, um, it would go into kind of a uh, query mode to find out if it's still active. Am I mistaken? Well, apparently it's not automatic because it didn't happen. So. <laughs> All right. Actually, I guess that's what, seven, almost 17 years. Correction, we did find a way to release uh, documents from the group, so we can do that. Okay. okay, I was about to say, yeah, there is something, ID exists, and that's it. Okay, yeah, because I think that's the right thing. They should just go back to and it become an individual draft again, and if the author wishes to pick them up, they can. And I can confirm, yes, we will send the update for the, the first one. Okay, good. Okay, next. Yeah, and this is just a reminder that there is other work that happens relating to IPv6 in other working groups. So any other comments on the intro? Or we'll proceed to the next talk.
All right, thank you. Tom, the room is yours. Okay, um, so my name is Tom Herbert, and today I'm going to talk about the latest version of limits on sending and processing IPv6 extension headers. Next slide. The changes in the last version, I think the most significant is it was changed to BCP. Uh, it previously was proposed standard. So this was feedback uh, we got from several um, points, including the chair's review and the ADs. We standardize on some of the ter terminology, including router, uh, nodes, uh, IPv6 nodes and such, and added a terminology section that describes that. Uh, there were some explanations that seemed unnecessary, so we removed those. We clarified the applicability of default limits. I think this was also uh, pretty significant, so there seemed to be some uh, questions around that. And then there were various other edits. Next slide, please. So on the default limits, uh, I do want to clarify this. Um, this did generate some discussion. So the default limits that we specify only apply when sending on an unknown path. So basically, the way I think of this is when you're sending into the internet, what, do, what limits does the sender start with? If the sender knows they're sending to a known um, network, then these limits can be freely exceeded. Um, one of the questions was, for instance, segment routing, there is no way we can fit in a segment route list into 64 bytes. But in the case of something like segment routing, the sender knows that it's already sending into a segment routing domain. So therefore the limits obviously need to be uh, much greater within that domain. So the 64 byte extension header limit that's described in the draft would easily um, be, be exceeded in that case. So again, these limits, default limits uh, for sending only apply when the sender doesn't know what the attributes and the capabilities are of the path and the destination. So basically it's when it's sending to anonymous nodes on the internet. But any other cases where we're sending into any sort of limited domain, presumably the sender would, would know that um, the limits can be exceeded and can use larger limits. The other one is the 64 byte header chain default limits for routers. So the idea here is that we want to specify that routers must support at least 64 byte header chains beyond the IPv6 header. The reason for this is, or the reason we even need this is because some routers actually require to be able to look into the transport layer so the 64 byte header chain <clears throat> is really any headers, including the IPv6 header, the, in, any IPv6 extension headers, and potentially any encapsulation headers. It's any headers that the router needs in order to get to the transport layer. And again, this is only certain routers that need to process the transport layer. If they don't need to process the transport layer, then this limit isn't applicable. So the important thing to understand about this is this limit is based on the constraints and capabilities of routers, not on the types of e extension headers. So um, this is a case where size actually does matter. So the size of extension headers matters. Um, if the size is too big, that pushes, potentially pushes transport layers too deep in the packet. Um, these routers are doing deep packet inspection into the transport layer. They can't find the layer four. Therefore, they can't do port filtering. Therefore, some of the policies they have are to drop because they uh, can't apply the policies. So again, to summarize, so the 64 byte header chain limit is independent really of the types of extension headers. It's really about what the routers can support in terms of their processing capabilities. And again, that's applies to the whole header chain, um, not necessarily just the uh, extension headers. Now, obviously in the extension headers draft, uh, we do set the normative requirements for sending the length of extension headers, 
uh, not so much normative requirements for sending the the full header um, chain without uh, considering or including things that aren't IPv6. Uh, but from the outer perspective, there's really no difference. If, if their concept of a header chain exceeds their limit, um, they can still drop the packet or will may, may drop the packet. Next slide. Uh, so next steps, um, as Bob mentioned, we did get feedback from the chair's uh, review of the update. Uh, I did look at it briefly. I have some questions on some of the, the points. Um, I can either bring them up here or respond on the list. Uh, also, there was uh, some feedback from Eric uh, more about the 64 byte limit uh, that we're setting, I believe, and whether or not that was appropriate for BCP. Um, I think it is, and I'll respond uh, to that thread also. Okay, I think that's it. Tim, are you in the queue? Uh, hi, Tim Chain. I realize now I'm just going to make the same comment that uh, Tom's just said someone else has made. That uh, I'd be very concerned that that 64 gets sort of baked in as something that you would never exceed once it's published as a, a BCP. And it does seem like a very small number. For example, I was in the Scion meeting, whatever day that was, and they said their header, if they do it this way, would need to be like 100, 120 bytes. So that's well. Already. So, so. It seems like a very small number, but bear in mind, this is support over the internet. It's a default limit. Also, if you look at um, existing solutions, IP options, TCP options, those actually have a smaller limit by default. Um, uh, the de limit is enforced by the protocol, but in terms of amount of data to be sent over the internet, I think the um, principle is it, it's pretty much. The other uh, point that I did uh, respond on that thread was that even now the data shows that routers tend to have somewhere around a 64 byte limit. So they've already kind of enshrined, enshrined this um, in what they've implemented. Uh, when we, so in the APNIC experiments, when they sent 128 byte extension headers, uh, the drop rate went up to 90% for destination options. For, I think it was 48 byte extension headers, the drop rate was only 10%. So this the size limit, again, isn't something that we're deciding from a protocol perspective. It really is what's there. So if we say that uh, router vendors used to support 256 bytes, um, it's, not, it's not gonna happen. They're, they have no motivation to change all this deployed technology. So I think there is a practical uh, implication here and, and why it's appropriate for um, BCP. Uh, the other point I would raise is RFC 9000, uh, quick, actually specifies some limits on extension headers also. And their default limit on extension headers is, for, for IPv6 is a grand total of 32 bytes. So it, it would be great if we lived in a world where we could set whatever limits we want and we can make this completely extensible, future-proof, and allow arbitrary number of bytes. But all the data and the current uh, implementation and deployment suggests that um, it won't be that big. Uh, however, I think the key here is we want the limit to be something greater than zero. Um, when routers implement a limit of zero for extension headers. That means we can't use extension headers are in that path. And that raises the problem. If even a few routers do it, a small percentage, it makes it really difficult from a sender's perspective to use extension headers at all because then it's hit or miss. So the goal of these requirements is to try to find a ubiquitous number such that if I'm a sender, I have a high confidence that my packets will go through if, if I do this. So yes, it's true that um, in the future, we may want larger limits. Um, that presumes that we actually have extension headers uh, that we send on the internet that need a larger limit. I, I don't think that's proven yet. 
Um, but for the current deployment and situation, I don't think that um, there's any path here to using a larger limit. Uh, uh, I'm looking at some of the comments, like Eric Klein's comment. It's, it's true. If we don't set something, uh, the default limit is going to remain at zero, which means extension headers are unusable. So it, it's always going to be a balance, right? This is a manifest constant. Um, it's a best guess. Uh, but we're trying to find a, a, a mix between something practical and something extensible. But the flip side is is essentially Gory's draft, which is an everything working for last which specifies the minimum of what should be supported. And I fully support that and like that. I just see a danger if you're trying to prescribe a maximum based on evidence rather than what you think is necessary. So for example, well, if you look at the last three hop by hop uh, header extension header RFCs that went through, what was there? There was the path minimum M MTU, there was alt mark, and there was something to do with IOM. Do those three require more than 64 bytes? Are we just saying those are going to be unworkable? Um, those no, are things but, that but are published as RFCs. If, if you send those today, it won't go through the internet. So, and, and again, this is a BCP, and we are explicitly saying this is a minimum limit. So the, the alternative is set a, a bigger minimum limit, but then that's not practical for vendors to support in the foreseeable future. The other alternative is don't set a limit, but then some uh, vendors will take it upon themselves to infer a limit and that limit could be zero. So I guess my question is what, what's the alternative here? If, you're if, saying, like I said, if we don't set a limit, uh, we don't win. If we set a limit, then it might not be the right one, but again, um, we don't win. So what we're looking for here is a practical answer more than anything. You're saying practical for on the internet, but really you mean practical for everywhere because there isn't another router I could go and buy that sits in my own network that magically has more capability. You're suggesting that no routers I can get. Have no, 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 no. That, 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 that's, that's not true. The draft is very clear. This sort of limit is a default and would only be applicable when you're sending it to the internet. For any other type of network, any limited domain, the limits can be much greater. Now, there could still be limits, um, you know, certainly we, we need that, but these would only apply when I'm sending to an anonymous destination on the internet. It's, it's the, it's the uh, lowest level, least common denominator of sending. So if I'm a sender and I'm sending to some unknown destination, I need to know what size of extension headers I can get through with high confidence. Right now, that answer is zero, and we can't use extension headers. So it, it, the, the draft says this uh, multiple times. These limits only apply when you're sending to an anonymous destination over an unknown path, basically when you're sending to the open internet. That makes sense? Uh, no, but I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Tim Winters, QA Cafe. So. When we put some of this text in node requirements about extension headers, I ran some testing. Over generic routers, we didn't run into a lot of these problems as individual black box with these extension headers, right? Now, we didn't test them under load, right? But they were able to forward the traffic. Where we found the problem is almost exclusively in policies and load balancers and other things outside. So I'm wondering if this should be a V6 ops draft instead of a six man because it's telling people running networks what they expect to have happen and not individual routers would be my, I would ask people to think about that because I get the limit part of this, but our experience with individual routers as a architecture component isn't that they're not able to forward this. It's because someone either configures it or there's a policy or something in front of it that causes that problem. And it's not the individual router. So I'm not sure you're gonna get what you want if you just target routers and they're forwarding ASICs is my, my only commentary on this. I think that's a um, uh, Actually, I, I have to disagree in that case because the problems we're seeing, it's definitely clear that the size of extension headers is relevant. Uh, some policy, for, for some things that's true. Hop by hop options are dropped uh, by policy. And that's something we're not gonna be able to change. However, the optic, optic data in particular shows that destination options pass if they're of a certain length. And the length, I believe, isn't so much policy. It's the capabilities of the router 
to find the transport layer. It's the, right, the parsing so buffer sizes and routers are the problem, I believe. Our experience with this has been individual routers do not run into this problem. But if you just send them the packet, I'll be clear, it's not under load, right? If it's under load, this is a different story because it goes to CPU and once it goes there, it's a totally different problem. But we found that people weren't just dropping these packets on the floor. It, it's something in a firewall, something else. I don't know. I know you're saying routers are dropping it. I think it's something in the network is dropping it. I would question if it's actually a router based on our data. Uh, uh, so, so that might be true. However, um, uh, Fernando's RFC, I forget which number it is, on the reasons extension headers are dropped, one of the reasons was that uh, they're too long and they force the transport layers too deep in the packet. So maybe we just need more data on that, but I do suspect that there are routers that have this problem because um, by router design, they have limited capabilities to process uh, a lot of headers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you... Yeah, we closed the queue actually after Lorenza. Now, John Linkova, no heads on at all. So I... Thank you, Tim, for saying most of my comments. My experience as well is that it's either policy or obviously the hardware limitations which are changing. What I'm curious is you we're basically setting hard coding a limit, which is probably based on the least common denominators because my home CPE is a router, right? So if you're setting a limit based on what devices could do, we're basically putting the same limit for like, $50 CPE and like a big high end, like a uh, backbone router, right? So I'm not sure it's uh, like um, practical. And also, yeah, I'm concerned that we put in a hard limit, which gonna change with the new like line card release by vendor. So yeah, I'm a, I kind of share a team concern and Eric's concern about uh, we might actually make it slightly worse because a lot of people will be that it's only thing I need to support ever. Yeah, just well, a uh, like I said, okay. um, so, uh, I'd like to respond to that. If we don't set a limit, then what is the expectation? If we don't set a limit, router vendors aren't going to volunteer to make things bigger anyway. Um, and, and like we said, they, they may choose ad hoc limits and that could be zero. So it's, it, So I think we have to do something here. Um, the question is, if it's not trying to set a limit as a BCP, uh, practical limit, then what's the alternative? Well, Lorenzo, really a, a few observations. I think, so first of all, I think your, um, your argument would be a lot more convincing um, if you uh, showed a graph of the data that you cite in like you're talking about the data and you're saying, you know, 64 bytes, 90%, you know, 128 bytes, 10%. That's pretty compelling, actually, if you want to do something in the real world. So having that graphed there in your presentation or what I think would, ha would have helped the room and, and folks listening. So um, I am sympathetic to the, to the argument that if you, don't, if you don't set a minimum floor, you won't get anything. And I think saying that if you support zero, you're out of bounds, I think that's a useful statement. Um, what I think we're sort of getting tied up into knots over is, oh, but if we say it's only 64, um, then it'll never be more than 64. And you're saying, well, better 64 than zero, right? So, so I, to be clear, I don't have a magical <laughs> solution here. But uh, uh, one thing, one, some things that we could do are saying that, like, yeah, you must support at least 64 and should support more. You could say that. You could also sort of over, and this is the kind of thing that happens over time, right? If if you if by saying must support 64, you get at least one or two use cases of extension headers, then they won't be this alien mind-sucking parasites that people say, oh, no, 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 we can't do that because it's really weird. We, we don't want to support that. It's going to be a use case where you can build more functionality over time, and it's going to be something where people are going to get used to using. And then as more use cases show up, then maybe people will support them better. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say to you, though, is that if you wanted to find working, then the only number is sadly zero because there are networks that will drop. Your 90% your number is actually much better than I thought it ever would be, but it's still 90% and not 100%. So maybe you might want to about, think about, you know, what is an app going to do about this? Is it going to be happy eyeballs or what's it going to do? So anyway, like I said, I don't have any solutions, but I'm sympathetic to saying we must have a floor. Otherwise, we can't ever do anything. Yeah. 
Super. Thanks. Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, so to wrap this up, um, so the chairs talked a little bit about this draft uh, Tom, um, over breakfast, and we sent a fairly uh, detailed chairs review. And, um, and this is a document that is fairly sort of fundamental to the core of V6. So what we would like to see, uh, what to suggest is that, uh, Tom, you do a new revision based on the, on the chairs review, and then we would like for two people from the working group to also do a review. Um, I mean, this slide here is wrong, right? It is in working group last call and it has been for a while. Uh, and with those reviews, I hope we can close the document off and, and send it off to the ISG. But we would need two passionate people about limits and extension headers to raise their hand uh, for this to proceed over that. Uh, but Tom, does that sound like an okay plan for you? You can just nod or, or blink one eye if you can't speak. <laughs> Tom, can you hear us? Or are you? Uh, we cannot hear you if you said. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was the question? Oh, the question was if if you were okay with a plan of doing a revision based on the chair's comments, then before proceeding the document to the ISG, we would have two more reviewers from the working group, uh, you know, detailed work through the, through the documents and, and then, you know, hopefully we can advance it. Uh, sure. <clears throat> Reviews are always good. Yep. But we need to. We'll take that to the mailing list if no one is. And one thing I heard is that someone used the word floor, I think for a requirement limit sort of is, ambiguous in a way that it's the, is it the maximum or the minimum limit? It might be good to use words that separate those ideas out. But we should go on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Xiaoming, the floor is yours. Do you want the clicker? I'll tell you this. You should be able to do that. Okay. okay. Uh, hello everyone, uh, it's Xiaomi from ZTE. Uh, this presentation is on IPv6 query for uh, enabled in situ OEM capabilities. Here is a, a recap of this draft. Uh, this draft defines ICMPv6 extension to achieve IOM capabilities discovery in IPv6 uh, networks. This chapter is a companion uh, document of RFC uh, 9359. Uh, this chapter uses RFC uh, 4620 uh, IPv6 node information Paris as a basis. Uh, five IOM capabilities objects are defined in this document. Uh, you, you can see the details on the slide. Uh, this chapter was presented at the last IETF, uh, IETF 117. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, David uh, Lamparter uh, raised uh, good comments uh, regarding uh, amplification attack threat. Uh, to address his comments, we uh, submitted an updated draft uh, before this meeting, and uh, a Resolution uh, is incorporated uh, in updated uh, draft uh, that uh, attempt to uh, address uh, David's comments. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also incorporated some uh, editorial changes into the updated draft. Uh, number one, uh, we revised revised the uh, uh, abstract to make a stronger connection between uh, RFC uh, 9359 uh, and this document. Number two, we changed the terms uh, from uh, node IOM information query to node IOM request from ID node IOM information reply to uh, node IOM reply because the new terms uh, seem uh, more common uh, and uh, more concise. 
Uh, number three, I, I changed the, the reference to uh, IPv6, I am over IPv6 encapsulation draft uh, because that draft has already been uh, published as I've seen uh, 94, uh, 86. Uh, here's the uh, new text introduced uh, in security uh, consideration section in the updated draft. Uh, to address uh, Davis' comments. Uh, an implementation uh, that supports this specification must uh, support an option of uh, padding a node IOM request packet to the past MTU or the minimum IPv6 MTU. That's uh, 1280 bytes. Uh, in that way, uh, it can be ensured that uh, the node IOM reply packet uh, would not be larger than the invoking node IOM request packet. And uh, the network operators can choose to enforce uh, the padding option or not in their networks. Uh, the intention is to uh, make a requirement for the implementation, uh, but to leave the flexibility to the operational use. Doesn't work? Okay. Uh, this slide shows the new text uh, in uh, abstract. Uh, this document describes the application of mechanism of di discovering IOM capabilities described in RFC uh, 9359, uh, ping enabled IOM capabilities in IPv6 networks. Uh, as I said before, uh, the intention is to make this, uh, make it a stronger uh, connection between uh, RFC 9359 and this document. So we made this change to the abstract. Uh, next steps, we ask for more uh, reviews comments, and we'll revise this draft to, to adjust your comments to improve it. And then maybe uh, working with last call. Thank you. So any comments? Eric, you are even in the uh, no, no hats. I, I'm, I wanted to ask about whether there's an upper bound on the information that could be put into a reply. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, how, how big can a reply be? Is there, is there a, a, a protocol limitation for the upper bounds? You mean uh, the, the, the packet size on the reply? Yes. I guess we put a limit on the size of the uh, node IM reply. That's the minimum uh, MTU for IPv6. Uh, on the, I thought the, you were padding to the, uh, the request message to that link. You're saying there's also a limit on the reply? Mm, yeah, the intention is to make sure that the reply uh, would not be larger than the request right. because we want to avoid the amplification uh, attack. That, uh, so yeah. we made this limit. I mean, it, it's uh, for all of the foreseeable use cases of IOAM information? 1280 is enough, or MTU is enough, you think? I don't really know <laughs> what, what goes in those things, so. Uh, I, I, I think it's suitable. Okay. But, but uh, if you have a different uh, opinion, we can discuss. I, I'm not deeply familiar with people who want to use this stuff, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no further comments, thank you. Oh. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, let's do a very quick uh, race show of hands of how many people have read this draft? Oh, have read this draft. Chance of getting the spelling right on this. Yeah. That's trying the component Yeah.
Yeah, so just for the very quick results here, I think the uh, try to get some more engagement on the mailing list, I think. Um, so we have four people out of about 100. So. OK. Yeah, 5%. Yeah, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tim Chown, can you come up to the pink box, please? It's, it's a cross, of course. I know, but it used to be a box. Do you want a clicker? Uh, yeah, thank you. We might have the latest, I'm not quite sure. I, well, we'll see. It's a okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm here to present an update on the update we presented in San Francisco on RFC 6724. Um, so it's myself, Nick, and Jeremy have been um, writing this. There was a 03 version that's just been posted um, in the last couple of days, actually, just to correct a typo. So the motivation for this, I'll try and be as quick as I can, and we'll get to the end and then just take the questions, is that 6724 is now about 10 years old. Um, we've got a lot more operational experience through um, its use, and one of the things that's come up is this issue of preference for ULAs versus V4 addresses in a local network. Um, what we're trying to do here, our goal is to make ULAs work for their original use case, that you use them within a site network, within a local domain, um, to talk between hosting that domain using those ULAs. And the problem at the moment is that if you have ULA to ULA or V4 to V4, as options, uh, the address selection mechanisms will come back and you'll be using V4 and not ULA. So as highlighted in bold there, one of the things that a number of sites are trying to do is just stop using V4, remove use of V4, uh, without necessarily turning it off first, just getting confident that it's not needed. So actually promoting ULAs to be used ahead of V4 addresses within the site um, certainly has value from that point of view. And the, the root cause of this is the precedence for uh, ULAs within the default policy table. Um, changes made to the draft syncs 117. We've tried to streamline it. I had a chat with Jen before uh, the session. I think we can probably streamline it and make it clearer further. Um, what we hopefully can get through today is that the intent of the draft is agreeable and then we can uh, progress forward. We've stripped out um, information about all the uh, the arguments for greater configurability um, to streamline it. We've removed the um, text about the next top hu router heuristic, but I'll mention that again in a moment. And the example of the GAI.conf, which I think was just, uh, people were saying was confusing um, and tweaked a couple of other things. Um, we've clarified that the preference here is for ULAs within the site over all V4 addresses, not just RFC 1918 and added a, 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 some comments on the relationship to, to other RFCs as well. Um, there was also a note added um, about the fact that now we may have some hosts that have no address selection uh, mechanism implemented. Some may still be stuck on 3484, some may be on 6724, some may do what we propose here, and some may do other things completely. So there's a whole lot of interop that um, maybe needs to th be thought about here. Um, so this is what we would change in the default policy table. So the, the three highlighted lines are the ones that would change. So as you can see there, the, uh, the precedence for V4 is lowered and the precedence for ULAs is uh, raised so that they would be preferred. Um, and also we've changed the six to four. Um, so it's on a par now um, with the old Teredo um, prefix. Um, just one note here. The question has come up three or four times on the list just to clarify. We're not here trying to promote um, the use of ULA, or dare I say the word NAT here, um, the use of ULA uh, GUA pairs over V4. If you have a candidate pair that's ULA GUA and a candidate pair that's V4 V4, it will pick V4. So it'll use V4 ahead of any um, unmentionables. And it will also, of course, prefer ULA to ULA over any V4 to any V4. So those are the two behaviors that you will, you will have. And I think Jen also made the point we should probably clarify that further in the draft just to emphasize that. Um, and I did say I, I would come back to this. Um, for those of you who saw Jen's talk yesterday in V6 Ops about V6 mostly, um, the use of Rule 5.5 is a very important part of this. Um, and at the moment in 6724, it does say 
under the 5.5 section, a little discussion paragraph about implementation not being required to remember which next hops advertise which prefixes. But actually, if you want this to work, you do kind of need that. So uh, I think it's Brian Carpenter's text below there. Apologies that somebody else. Um, but we could change that text to say what is said there, that it's required to remember which next hops advertise which prefixes. And this is also something that comes up in RFC 8028 about selection of, of next hop routers. There's talk, uh, there's text about 5.5 in there as well, and we could strengthen it here to complement that. And then finally, the last slide, there has been some related list discussion that's come up. There's, I think I can count it, something like 450 messages. Um, not all about the thrust of what this draft is about, which is the preference for ULAs over V4 within the site, but there's all sorts of other suggestions and helpful, maybe <laughs> or unhelpful comments that have come up. Um, you know, the idea of inserting an observe slash 48 ULA prefix into the policy table, that actually might be an interesting thing to do and it may help, but I think it's off somewhat at a tangent. Um, the idea of adding a new label for private V4 address prefixes. At the moment, all V4 addresses in the policy table have the same label. There are some potential benefits of having different labels for um, private address space. Uh, I think it was Brian again that suggested you know, maybe there's a, a different function that should be written to replace get adder info. And if you had that, then 6724 may not even be required, but that's, you know, that's, that's a little bit more esoteric maybe, but it, it's, it would be something that would be useful to have. There was a whole load of stuff about NAT66 and MPT66 and the proposal to have a new um, prefix for translatable UAs. So you could, if you knew you were going to use the unmentionables, then you would have a prefix that would be a translatable ULA. Um, so that's, this is the sort of thing that was coming up on the list. And uh, Uli got so carried away with that that he went home and uh, changed his home network to be ULA only and used that NPT66. And now I see NPT66 is uh, the, the status of that is being proposed to change. I don't know that's a result of your home network or, or something else. Um, Another thing that came up was the, the suggestion to make 5158 historic as part of the discussion about demoting six to four here. And there's a whole lot of other th wider changes proposed about making source and destination address selection work better with multi-homing and have the eyeballs and so on. So, um, so I think what, just the final, final slide, what the authors here would like is uh, hopefully the blessing that in principle, what we're, the intent of what we're saying here and what's written in the, the current draft is good and you're happy with that. We can streamline it further and make it a lot more clear exactly what those behaviors will be as per the slides there. And if that's good, we can progress that hopefully. The sort of sideline to that is whether we do want to also come back and change that text about in 6724 about rule 5.5. And then finally, there's a whole bunch of other things that have come up on the list as a result of this issue being raised. And what do we want to do about those? There's presumably some new drafts that could be written and if so, about what and who's going to do them. So that's everything I have to say. So over for questions. Jen Linkova, again, no hats on. Yes, uh, so I read this draft twice this morning. I was slightly confused. And I, I think it would be really beneficial if the draft would make clear that we're talking about ULA to ULA, yes, not yes. just APVC, ULA in general, because it's not very clear. And as I talked to you uh, before the session, I think it would be really nice to have a section saying what, how it worked before, how it worked now, and yeah, why, yeah. and maybe explicitly specifying, maybe showing the logic why you would not break uh, ULA to global like not be working. And also, please clarify or remove your session about happy eyeballs, because there is a section which literally saying, yeah, and if I ULA think... is chosen for global destination, happy eyeballs will take we care may, of it. It may be simply just Yeah, to and it just that. Make me yes. that, make, made me think that, oh, Focus so on what it does rather than, yeah. Yeah, like so yeah. like, uh, we, we, probably it could be rephrased as, if for some reason uh, the client does not do the right thing and still uses, so kind of yeah, clarify and it's not gonna happen. Will, yeah. yeah. And speaking of rule five, yeah. And yeah. for rule five five, well, I am biased. I obviously <laughs> would like to see that, especially because we have uh eighty what twenty-eight uh RFC, mm. which Brian and Fred wrote, uh, which already saying that client should uh do that. So uh, maybe Well we had the feedback last time to streamline it, but having 
yeah. seen your presentation on Monday. Well, that, that's making us think, no, we actually really do need to emphasize this. Yeah, it's, so like practically, it's, it's like think we need to do, right? If you want to deploy not just multi-homing, right? Mm -hmm. If you're actually doing reasonably complex uh, network, when client can move, you have to have this, right? Yeah. Otherwise, things will get broken. So I would s support uh, changing it to should, especially as I say, yes. we already have an other RFC saying that. So yeah. Yeah, and we'll also add the reference to 8028 in it as well. Tim Winters, QA Cafe. So I was a young student and I wrote some test cases for address architecture, the original one, and I missed that note about implementations needing to track the next top for rule 5.5. And it went really poorly because nobody tracked it, like at all. Mm -hmm. So it's a test case we don't normally run because of that. Now what it is looks like today, I don't know, but I suspect that a lot less people track the next top they're getting prefix from than we hope. So I don't know if required is going to work there. I, I would think you're going to have to get away with a should. I, we can get into the conversation of low-end boxes here, and that's where this problem comes up, like a generic Linux box is not going to do this. Yet, do we want a phone to do this? Yes. Do we want every device that's got Linux embedded into it to do it? I don't know. Yeah, I think a should is oh, going to be pragmatic. All right. I got people behind me saying, yeah, I mean, you, if, if you want to do that, I would put must instead of required and just drop it and say we're, we're doing this. But I will say this went very, very poorly for young 20 year old Tim winners. So be careful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was the, what was I going to say? Yeah, I mean, the, at the moment, 6724, it's, it has rule 5.5 and then sort of this little discussion note under it that goes, well, it doesn't really matter, but it does, I think. And that's what we want to say somehow. Yeah, uh, Lorenzo Khalid, to be clear, I mean, just because we want it to happen doesn't mean we can uh, will it to happen, right? So saying must and causing all Linux implementations to fail whatever IPv6 conformance test is your, I don't know if that's a sort of useful outcome yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely should is, is, is sort of uh, at least, I would say, uh, desirable. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you can, well, okay, so then so that does that mean that like, because I can't do 5.5, I'm not gonna implement this other stuff here? Anyway, um, just, uh, um, and yeah, it, Linux is the one, is the big odd one out here. Uh, David, please fix. Um, I know that someone in the room has code. But anyway, <laughs> so. Um, I wish uh, he wasn't laughing like that. <laughs> a few, well, uh, a few things. Um, let's not say we don't wanna, we don't make any recommendations about NAT. The only recommendations that we can make about that is to discourage it. Let's remove the text from the draft. There's yeah, no room. Jen said on. the same thing, and I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, there is some sort of what looks like a bit superfluous text, like section six, seven dot two, maybe could be sort of streamlined and deleted. Um, section six is sort of, I think it's like a bit fluffy. It doesn't seem bad much, but yeah. And uh, seven seven point two. Actually, not even sure that it's true. It says that well, you'll get an ICMP and reachable, and you will like move on and assumes the ICMP unreachable was generated, that it didn't get rate limited, that you got it, that, you, that your TCP stack processed it, all stuff that I think is sort of, so yeah, if we just remove that, it, it's probably not a use case that's gonna happen anyway, right? So, but other than that, I, I, I do think this makes sense. Okay, thank you. Ted Lemon. Um, so I just wanted to respond to the should versus must discussion that we just had. Um, the fact that uh, something that must work in order for func in order for things to function doesn't work is a problem and the fact that that thing fails a conformance test is not a problem it's exactly the correct behavior <laughs> so i think that that should be a must and all of those things that don't implement rule 5.5 should fail and that will motivate people to fix the bug well presumably the three platforms that jen mentioned on monday all support it um... I, I two platforms. Sorry, don't know. Honestly, I don't know whether we support it. I haven't checked recently. You if do. That's why it works. I uh, thank you very much. I don't know who did that, but so now you can stand there and say must for you. <laughs> no, that's not why though. Why is because the re the way you get stuff like this fixed is to is to say it's broken mm. and embarrass people. I mean, I don't really want to embarrass them. It's just like you know, it's a bug. It needs to be fixed. It's not a big deal. Let's fix it. I mean, it, fixing it might be a big deal, but. Let's not go down that role. Um, anyway, I just think it should be a must. I don't think I think making it a should sends exactly the wrong message. We want these tests to fail. Okay. Anyone else? 
Okay. Great. Ted, do you have a proposal on how to reach consensus on whether to put should or must in this document? I mean, I know you you would would advocate for must, and I I can actually see that. I'm just saying, you know, how do we get from you know the current text to must? We just like call a harmless. I don't know. I mean, I I think that's a for the chairs to decide if they if they agree that this is worth pursuing. Why not just ask the question? Do people really need this to to be a should or should it be a must? And if <laughs> Sorry. It, it must, must be, be a should. should. No, it must be a must. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> well, so, so I mean. The, yeah, this, this is a so, serious so, point. We need to get some resolution. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the technical point here is that if you don't implement 5.5, then a bunch of stuff doesn't work. Mm. And I think that is uh, like consensus is not who votes for what. Consensus is has a technical objection been raised? And if so, have we addressed it? One way to address it is to say, look, this is too hard. We're not doing it. So the working group should decide, is this too hard and we're not doing it or should we just do it? So and if we're making all of these changes anyway, I think we're already saying that we should do some stuff. Why not have this be one of the things that we do? So AT28 says a lot about 5.5. .5. Is that performance of that, oh, Tim, is, it the, is that sort of conformance? Is, t is conformance of that tested? Is it the right level to be tested? So, and if so, do things pass it? So a lot of people assume all of this actually works today, as Ted is indicating. A lot of people think that hosts will actually do all of these magical things. And that sentence is why a lot of hosts do not do those magical things, because we let them out. You know, Both of the US government test program, Ready Logo doesn't test this. The US Gov test program has this, the way it's written, says, you know, if you don't track the next top, you can skip this test. And everybody skips this test. Like almost everybody, um, because they don't track this. So if you want this to work this way, as Ted is suggesting, then you need to change this to a must. The should, I think we could test anyway and tell people they don't do it. But I, a lot of people assume this works this way. <laughs> they read this RFC, miss that note. Like I said, it's, it's a hard one to find. And what happens is, is that they they don't do it. And here we are. You know, it does break things because people have the expectation that Rule Five Five is going to work, and it doesn't. Okay. Um, yes, I'm the queue again. Uh, no hats on, but I always read like must means if you violate this, something gets broken, right? Should means we, wa we want this in most of the cases, but I can imagine a scenario when we don't need this, right? So yeah, it's kind of, this case it's kind of borderline because someone might say that if device never moves, if it's only connects to one network, right? You basically put a lot of sticky tape around it and never change the subnet and never change the physical port. Then yeah, we don't need that thing, right? But yeah, I'm kind of, I well, yes, I just I think, think we, yeah, a must would be nice. I just don't think if it's like realistic yeah. because I talked to implementers and yeah, I have some concerns. But the thing is we did not have the use case until recently, right? Nobody, like we do we do not have multi-home deployments mm -hmm. when it's critical. Yeah. Not so many people apparently doing .1x uh, on V6 uh, and notice that yeah, you might change subnets and so on, right? So yeah, I, I understand why it was May, like not even saying May, right? It was if you do this, you also probably uh, do that, right? So I, we definitely need to make this happen before we start going to people and suggest them, please deploy IPv6. Because otherwise they will deploy IPv6, it will fail miserably, and people will continue to say, oh, this V6 thing is not ready for the market. Uh, as an implementer, I just want to say, you know, that, you know, that what this draft is trying to do is, I don't know, three lines of code, uh, five to five. <laughs> is a mess. So um, I don't know how many lines of code that its implementation is, but I, I guarantee it's more than three. And it's kernel code and so on. Um, that said, so, so I guess one question is, um, if we tie these together, which, which by the way, I mean, I think actually maybe the right way to do this is to, is to go with Eric's suggestions. Like, OK, must if you implement the specification. And you can always say, well, we don't implement that yet. And then some tests fail, and we're like, well, we don't implement that yet. And that causes some amount of back pressure, and maybe that's the right way forward. Because if, I mean, the other thing is, like, if we never say anything, then nothing will happen, right? So, so maybe we can get consensus on that thing, saying, like, you know, you know, host implementing the specification must you know, also do 5.5. 5. 
the question for the authors would be, if we go that way, would you regret it bitterly? Because people are just going to say, ah, that whole RFC is too hard. We're not even going to implement the ULA thing. That's sort of question for you. I would sort of, you know, I guess, I guess maybe, you know, trying to take my implementer hat off for a second saying, okay, like if we have must here, actually it would be better. <laughs> and so, but again, right. If that results in like the, your ULA change is not going through, would you regret it? And again, because there are only three lines, maybe those would happen anyway, but there is a risk that tying the two together would lessen. Another question is, if we don't say must here, when are we going to do that? Yeah. Are we going to, when are we ever going to muster the, you know, the, uh, muster the strength and make it a must. But uh, anyway, when are we going to write an R document that says, okay, must do five, five. Well, I think we need to clearly elevate the importance of this, make it more widely known as Tim was saying, as he's missed it. Um, so yeah, as the question is whether we do that here coupled with that, or it's a separate document or something, it needs to be done. David. Someone else in the oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's nobody important. It's just me. Um, <laughs> so as one of the co-authors, um, you know, first of all, thanks for having this fruitful discussion. Uh, I just wanted to give an anecdote of uh, someone who is not an implementer, but is tasked with doing things like turning V4 off across, you know, large portions of big networks. Um, I can say that when <clears throat> features are not required, it becomes a very laborious task to go to each vendor that you're doing procurements from and ask them to implement something that isn't a requirement. So for example, you know, buying a, a set of hardware, um, you know, let's say you're buying 200 devices, right? It's not a huge amount, it's not a small amount, and it doesn't do one thing that you need it to do. First of all, you have to convince them that they need to do it, which is a you know often a, a Herculean task. And second of all, you've got probably a lead time of, of a minimum of one year to get that implemented. So uh, probably two, depending on the difficulty of it, um, which it sounds like this one was fairly difficult. Uh, so I, I'm not trying to sway one way or the other, but that is uh, you know that is a, a, a consideration for making something uh, you know must required is that when you actually need it and it isn't available, it's often very very hard to get it available, especially if you don't have a lot of leverage. Like if you're not a you know, a mate, like a cloud, you know, a huge Piper scale or something like that. So with that, I'll stop talking and um, the next person can go. Uh, David Lamparter, um, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of making this a must. And for, I would rather pose the question as, do we want to introduce the must in this document or do we would just want to start a new document that is a two page document that just changes this one thing? Um, I'm not this sure. This is how... an update to 6724. So this effectively changes 6724. Right. So. Well, but, but we can have a separate second... document would at least emphasize it more. You can point someone at that, I suppose. Mm. Okay, I guess that answers the question I was trying to yeah. ask, which is how much overhead is doing a separate document for this? It uh, wouldn't take long to do, but it's up to the chairs. I mean, they, they can guide us. Yeah. To... I did a, a quick search for um, Impul to see if there's an implementation section. I was just gonna ask you, did people implement this or uh, unit test a policy table parser to verify that you get the results you want? Good question. Um, not that I'm aware of. Maybe Nick, if he's listening, has uh, an answer for that one. I did a lot of testing early on uh, with, uh, with Linux systems in particular, just because that's what I have access to. Um, and the behavior was, mostly what we expected. So I don't have it in front of me. It was actually about 18 months ago when I did it, but um, my testing of it was fairly straightforward. I believe Brian Carpenter also did a fair amount of- There were some comments on the list as well yeah. about people who had done likewise, but not formally, but it was- uh, Yeah, there was no formal- Anecdotal, I guess you would probably politely call it. Thank you. May I quickly comment on this? I recall that a few years ago, InnoRay did some testing on default address selection. Okay. I don't remember if he tested the particular Z part, but you might want to give a presentation no. yeah. at Drive on V6 Group. I, I can't remember the year, but I probably can take okay. a look. Thank you. Yeah, George. Um, from the operational point of view, 
this would massively improve the IPv6 implementations all around the world and the quality of communications of the end users. So please implement this as, as fast as possible. You weren't quite at the microphone, but I, I heard you. The remote people might not have. Okay, so, so thanks, Tim. Um, I think what I'm hearing is that we will need a new revision. Mm. I think we That's probably fine. would yeah. appreciate a implementation section. Uh, I think it's worthwhile that we ask the question in the room if there is support for a must or will five five. Um, so we'll do a hum in the tool, unfortunately. You can hum inside of yourself if you want to. <laughs> but yes uh, means must if you implement this specification. No means that we keep the should. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Good. And we have no option for no opinion, so please don't choose that. Yeah, oh, that's looking. It's a very loud, uh, loud sound. Plus from one the left for me because I don't here. have my yeah. phone. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah, I think we have a. You have an answer. Yeah, there's a good that. steer there. Thank you, Uli. Yeah, I will confirm that on the mailing list, of course. But at least okay. I think that's it. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tim. So the next man for the pink cross is Lorenzo Coletti. There's the clicker. Okay. So Signaling the issue six prefix delegation availability. Now, if you think you might have seen this before, it's because you have um, several times, in fact. Uh, next slide. Actually, can I? Oh, OK. So it is a companion to the uh, exciting and, uh, and much discussed uh, DHP PD per device draft, which has uh, been uh, just um, made it out of last call. Um, just to recap, um, we are trying to find a way to hint to the device whether it should use PD or whether it shouldn't use PD, okay? So um, the reason is that in some networks, for various reasons, scalability, for example, you might want to assign a prefix to a device. Uh, let's call it a router, um, most usefully. Um, but it could be something that looks like a host, but it's actually a router. Um, and um, so this, this might be the case in a large enterprise network. For example, like the Google Enterprise Network, you know, we have loads of address space, we have lots of slash 32s, and we have C routers plugged into our desks and so on. Um, and we have, enough, we have plenty of space we can assign a 64 to every host if we want. Um, on other networks, like my home network, which only has a 64, Neuro, if you're listening, please fix. Um, uh, so we don't have an address scaling problem with individual 128s but we definitely don't have enough prefixes to hand out a 64 per device. And at the moment, uh, when I say 64, it's a Brian compliant 64, which means a 64, but if we change Slack to another value, it's that other value. It's whatever value Slack is supported on. Um, so the, again, the proposed solution is we add a new flag to the PIO that says, don't use this PIO for Slack, but instead of doing that, um, start DHPPD, get a prefix and do whatever you want with that prefix. Assign addresses, but also, you know, that prefix will be yours, it's delegated to you. Uh, but most importantly, don't do Slack on the on-link prefix. Has to be in the PIO because it's got to be available to the device before it runs Slack, otherwise it will run Slack. And it's specific to that prefix because you might not want to do this for ULAs or you might have different upstreams with different, you know, address assignment policies. Um, how many, okay. Uh, um, I, well, I mean, it's oh, difficult for me to, there. yes. Okay. So your chairs don't want to hear from you. Uh, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Um, so what, what changed recently? Why am I here again? Uh, the PD per device draft just passed a working group last call. It's on its way to the shepherd write up. And also we've made some changes. Um, there has been some confusion from a few parties saying, 
you know, is this prefix the same as the PIO? Why is it different? Is it different? And we clarified to say, yes, it is absolutely different. Um, in fact, if you if you do PD, don't look at the PIO at all for the purposes of address assignment. You can still might want to use, do look look at it for on-link determination and so on, but don't use the A flag. Treat it as if the A flag was zero. And uh, we also added text to ensure that source address selection works uh, reasonably well. That text is new. Well, they pointed that out, obviously. And um, our implementation kind of cheats on this at the moment. Um, so yeah, we need to fix that. But um, uh, other than other minor changes. Uh, so we changed host to device uh, because the v6 op ops document talks, to, talks about device. Um, hopefully this is not controversial. We have routers, hosts, somebody coined Hooter or whatever, Houter, but yeah. So, um, but basically minor changes. And so what we are really doing was we were waiting for, you know, the PD per device draft, which is the network side of this to uh, pass working group last call before we could sort of come here and ask for adoption, which we are now here to ask for. Um, so any questions? I see one question. Martin, please go ahead. Hi, Martin Hunyek. Uh, I would have several points here. Uh, just uh, one thing is if uh, the host should really uh, disregard uh, uh, the Slack if it's just the uh, PFLAG set. Uh, I would say that uh, I understand that you want to uh, eliminate the issue of multiple addresses per host. But I should, uh, I think that uh, it should also consider L flag. So if the operator wants to have uh, uh, on-link connectivity between the host, it's probably uh, for some reason. So uh, to disregard a flag only if the L flag is not set. Uh, it would be the one point. Uh, the second one would be. Uh, if uh, the PFLAG shouldn't be uh, more global than the pair prefix, because if you don't have any uh, prefix uh, for auto configuration and you want to use uh, PD for hosts, that's probably uh, more suited uh, along uh, M and O flag on the RA. Yeah. If, if you also change the behavior of the L flag, considering L flag. So you could also do uh, uh, this only for some prefixes which are not on link. Yeah. Yeah, a global flag is tricky, right? You have a very difficult problem when two different routers, two different upstreams have different policies. DRC is very clear that like the last global flag or two we received wins. So if you put this in the RA as a global flag, then you've got two routers. One of them says you can get PD from my bat. So, so if you have two routers from different administrative domains, like a Comcast and AT&T router, if, you, if one of them wants to say, yeah, I support this, and the other one wants to say no, you can't use a global flag because they will fight each other. Um, and yeah, so- but there are still two, two routers. No, the, the flags are global. That's very clear in the RC. Yeah. The RA, the, okay. the, the 4862 says, the host receives the latest value of the flag from the latest RA it's received. And basically every time it receives a different RA, it will change its mind. Okay, my, my bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the on-link flag, I think we can talk more. Um, the, uh, I think you're proposing that if L equals uh, zero, we wouldn't? No. Uh, if uh, the link is uh, off-link, the, the prefix off-link, then uh, okay, uh, just use PD. If it's on link, mm. then uh, just uh, then also use a Slack because you want then end to end connectivity. And how would we prefer? Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, so I guess it's actually interesting because if you have L equal one, right, you still can ignore Slack, but you know that those addresses are on link and you can treat them as on link, right? Having L flag doesn't mean you, you can have L equal one and A equal zero, right? So basically, P flag is basically making A zero. It's all it does, right? It doesn't change meanings of L flag. So you still can talk to your neighbors using your link local address or global address on link. And actually, V6 of draft talks about a bit about peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. And if you have peer-to-peer -peer isolation anyway, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't, if you want peer-to-peer, -peer, you might kind of rely on ICMP redirects in one direction for return traffic and for outgoing uh, traffic, you just treat L, if it's one, okay, I'll send neighbor discovery for that address. 
about the, then uh, the behavior of uh, half of the host could be different uh, in peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication than other half. Uh, if half uses PD and half does not, then the only communication behaves differently. Uh, but, but it has to be because you can't just send ND on the link. You have to send it up to the router anyway. So let, let's take this to the list, I think. I mean, L configures routing, not addressing, right? So I think that's also something where it's... Yeah, kind of weird to reuse you, it for you that. You can also have both uh, uh, PD for uh, offline communication and Slack for online communication. Yeah, yeah, but but it's overloading the behavior of L, though. It, it's it's true that you know. Anyway, let's take that to the list. Yeah. Okay. And then there is also one uh, thing uh, that auto configuration on the downstream is not just Slack. So it specifically uh, the draft uh, says Slack, but it could be any auto configuration. So maybe. Just uh, oh, it could be any mechanism yeah. at all. Yes, I, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Maybe yeah, cross okay. the, yeah. the, the, the Slack thing. Yeah. And uh, the last thing, uh, the bit elephant in the room, uh, is the cl uh, clean behavior for smaller than 64. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, currently it is necessary for Slack, but uh, may, there might be some uh, implementation that do not rely on Slack. So they might also want to, uh, to use a similar approach. So uh, maybe uh, just uh, cross out the limitation. Uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah, no, I mean, I think that also is, I think that is, you know, that question I think, I hope will be settled, you know, when, when the ITF last call for the, for the PD draft, right? I think uh, um, that draft explains why there's this limit and as it turns out, this is the only working group that can change that 64. So I think it's more productive if we really think that that 64 is a problem, that we actually roll up our sleeves and try to change it. OK, thank you. It, but, but we have to do something if we wanted that to happen. I don't, think we should, I don't think we should compromise on the functionality of this mechanism just because we think 64 is too wasteful. I think we should maybe plan that if this mechanism is successful, which it may not be, then maybe we'll have to eventually change. If we see that it's using up too much address space, then we should change the stack limit. Yeah, uh, just one note on uh, uh, that. Um, maybe there should be also some behavior of, of the host uh, published there, what to do if it is declined. Uh, so for example, if uh, IS op operator wouldn't uh, give you slash 64, and you would, uh, part of your implementation or uh, the host would actually need a little bit less, then, uh, OK, uh, should it just ask for a different length then? That would be a violation of the RFC, of the PD RFC, if it was published, right? Yeah. So it wouldn't happen. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah, should, yeah. Thanks, Martin. Uh, team, you have the last word. I'll make it quick. The L flag discussion. There's a lot of unnumbered networks, in particular in broadband space, that this is going to be problematic if you make decisions. So be careful what yeah. you do with the L flag. So, uh, okay, so before I ask for the uh, room's view on the adoption call, could we just get a physical show of hands of how many people have read this draft? You can delete the slides now. Okay, one, two, three, four, ten. Yeah, fair let's, number. fair enough number. So let's, uh, let me press the tool here and um, we'll confirm this on the list, of course, regardless, but at least we get a sense of the room. And among the people who said no, um, would you mind coming to the mic and, and stating your objection? Because that, you know, that's very interesting to hear. You know, or you can take it to the list for sure. But the mic is open for objectors, at least. Going. You might have to open the queue for that. <laughs> the objectors have um, retreated to two in number, I think. <laughs> oh, the threat of uh, have asking themselves to explain themselves on the open mic is right, sufficient yeah. to... Well, uh, but then take it to the mic and post anonymously if that's possible. But if we didn't want to scare anyone away. Apologies for that. But, but thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you. We'll confirm that on the mailing list. Okay. Then I think it's Margaret. Um, 
And I just want to emphasize that since this is, has been a slightly contentious topic in the past, that let's try to be gentler than we have to be. <laughs> so please go ahead, Margaret. So um, I just want to start by saying uh, this was not, you know, all my idea. There are four of us listed here who've been talking about this, and it started with people other than me, in fact. Uh, but I agree with it and somehow got the hot potato of presenting these slides. Uh, so RFC 6296 is the NPT V6 specification. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, I do that. <laughs> um, we need to set some terminology to have a useful discussion. We're not trying to shift opinions, but um, NPTV6 is this proposal, okay? It's a one-to-one -one stateless algorithmic checksum neutral prefix translation algorithm. Uh, the primary use cases are address independence and site multi-homing for sites using provider allocated addresses. NAPT, it, you can have it be 6.6 six or 4.4 four or other choices, uh, is stateful NAT with port translation. Okay, that allows you to share an IP address between multiple nodes using different ports, et cetera. Uh, NAT is stateful address translation without port translation. And NAT66 is an ambiguous term. All over the internet, you can find things that say NAT66 is this specification, or that NAT66 is NAPT66. So maybe we could try not to use NAT66 during this discussion because it's ambiguous. And if we want to specify one of these things, actually specify it. Uh, so these are the definitions we're using in this presentation. Next, oh, I keep. Why do I keep doing that? <laughs> the, uh, the background from, you know, 2010 was that IPV address shortages were not the only issue, scaling issue, threatening the internet. Uh, there were a lot of presentations at the time about the growth of the global routing tables and how, in fact, the growth of the global routing tables might threaten growth of the internet before address exhaustion. And so there was a lot of talk at that time about how to fix the growth of the global routing tables. And most of that growth was not because uh, we had very large entities and there were so many of them, okay? It was long prefixes being inserted into the top level BGP routing tables uh, because of the way people were doing site multi-homing, or the way they were using provider independent addresses and moving between ISPs. Both of those involved inserting uh, addresses for small and medium-sized networks into the global routing table to make them work. And that was what was um, identified as the source of the problem. Uh, we moved toward provider allocated addresses to slow that growth. Um, the swamp space in IPv4 was still there, but we stopped allocating um, provider independent addresses to sites and told them they had to get their addresses from their ISP. And we also made most of the IPv6 address space provider allocated with the idea that only people who basically are their own ISP could get provider independent addressing. But edge networks at small and medium organizations, people who weren't their own ISP, still needed address independence so that they could change ISPs uh, if they wanted to without having to renumber their whole network or if their ISP renumbered them, which happened with disturbing frequency. So we started to look at how to fix that in IPv6 without resorting to network address port translation, like most people were doing in IPv4 to resolve this problem. So let's go to the next slide. There were a, a number of proposals that 
I, in my mind, group into two schools of thought about how to solve this problem. Most people agreed that these issues were largely caused by the fact that the IP address conflates the location of a node, the topological location on the internet, with the identity of the node. And that both of those things were squished into one 32-bit value in IPv4 and a much longer value in IPv6. But we didn't really change the way routing worked. It was still the prefix was used to find the network the node was on. And the, there was a subnet <laughs> that was used to find which uh, subnet inside that site. And then there was a host portion, which was used to identify the eventual host. And people started talking about how could we split these things, so ID locator split, in order to solve some of the problems that were causing the exponential growth of the routing tables. And these proposals fell into two categories. Some of them did rewriting of the address or some portion of the address at the edge of the um, edge network and or the border of the edge network. And some of them did tunneling, like Lisp is probably the best known one of those, but there were several at the time. Ultimately, um, these categories form a continuum. They're not really as different as you might think because address rewriting mechanisms are similar to, and if, if you think of them, they can move right up to almost being a tunneling solution a degenerate tunneling solution where the information to build the outer or inner header is configuration at the edge. And tunneling solutions can come uh, toward NAT solutions by doing things like uh, coming up with ways to compress the inner header uh, and do some sort of uh, transference at the edge um, in order to reduce the MTU issues and so forth caused by tunneling. Okay, yep. So anyway, there's trade-offs between address rewriting and tunneling. Um, address rewriting, which NAT is one of the things that can do address rewriting. Uh, nodes don't know their global address. Uh, there might be a the need for ALGs or the use of DNS names in applications. Transport layer checksum corrections is needed. There's stateful uh, translation issues with brittleness in the network. Uh, no connection continuation if the router reboots, for instance. Uh, and poor uh, answers for asymmetrical routing and dynamic routing in the internet. And you need to have a topology aware or split DNS. Tunnels have MTU issues. And they also need a mapping function to go from what outer address should be mapped to what inner address, et cetera. Uh, they're not incrementally deployable, which was a huge problem with those solutions and continues to be because you don't get any benefit unless the other side has a, a tunnel endpoint and they also need topology aware of split DNS. So go ahead. So we proposed NPTV6, which is a one-to-one -one prefix translation. It's algorithmic and it is checksum neutral. So nodes still don't need to know their global, don't actually know their global address and there's still a need for topology aware or split DNS. But most of the other problems with both kinds of solutions are eliminated. So next slide. Document history, originally published in 2008, discussed in Behave, republished in 2010, discussed in Six Man V6 Ops and elsewhere. Uh, the, the name was changed at that time by Fred Baker, who's a very smart man. To, <laughs> to um, emphasize the significant differences between NPTV6 and traditional IPv4 NAT, whether or not it's a port translation. And uh, Fred also wrote the code and did the proof that the algorithm would actually produce one-to-one -one results. And it was published in 2011 as an IETF experimental RFC. Um, but there was no specific defined experiment or term of the experiment, which was typical of experimental RFCs at that time. And it said that it was published for examination, experimental implementation, and evaluation. Next. So how did that experiment go? Uh, over the last 12 years, it's been implemented by many vendors and widely used to solve the problems it was intended to solve. 
Uh, it's been implemented by Cisco, Juniper, Huawei, you can read. Uh, NPTV6 has been widely used to predict edge networks from um, ISP renumbering and ISP changes, and it simplifies deployment of multi-honed edge networks, all without needing to insert uh, long routes into the routing tables. Um, there's no other solution to these problems that, that doesn't have some compromises, okay? And NPTV6 is less disruptive and it's incrementally deployable. So we think the experiment was a success. Next slide. Uh, why a BIS document instead of just writing a little document saying we want to move this to the standards track? Uh, it's because we need some minor document changes. Uh, the ICMP v6 error handling is not up to current snuff, and we would want to do that, probably taking some language from uh, RC 5508. Uh, we need to clean up some editorial issues. There's a few typos in a sentence fragment, and incorporate the one errata that we've received on this document since it was published. Uh, why move it to the standards track? Um, the experiment has been successful. Uh, it's technically mature and widely deployed, and it's well understood. We're planning to do a document update, and we think it makes sense to publish that updated document as a standards track document to reflect its widespread implementation and deployment. And now you can ask this question, because you're a chair like human. <laughs> so, so I'll probably let Bob chair it, but should we, uh, we can run through the microphone queue first. I think we have uh, Julius, Lorenzo, and Eric. Julius, you're first. Okay, so uh, first of all, so I already told you some 10 years ago how grateful Cl Closer I... to the mic, uh, Julius. Okay, so I already told you some 10 years ago how grateful I was that you wrote it down so that if people implement it, at least they will implement it right. But I think I'm not alone in thinking that we sh rather wish people did not implement it. The draft is very insistent. In fact, it goes on for six or seven sure. paragraphs saying, don't implement this, use this. I know don't implement agree. this, use this. But I people, agree. Um, you get to the bottom and there are still a couple of issues we don't have a thing to point to in order to solve. Uh, it's not introducing any new code points, any new values, so there isn't any really strong reason for it to be standard track. And uh, since standard track, I know that's not what standard track means, but it's sometimes taken to mean that means the ITF wants you to implement it. And in order to avoid this kind of misunderstandings, I would much rather prefer it to be published as information. Uh, Lorenzo Colidi, I, I don't see a reason to republish it at all. I, I don't want to be violent, and I'm not going to be violent, but I do pretty strongly disagree with this. Um, did have will, I think. I, I think most importantly, I think, you know, one thing that, that is important to note was IPv4 couldn't do multiple addresses per host, and it couldn't do renumbering in any reasonable way. And those two are things that you need for multi-homing with PA space, right? I think if you look at, and the other thing that in, uh, when this document was originally written, since then we have made a lot of progress in multi-homing solutions that actually involve PA space. I mean, I think Jen has three or four of them. And I think we need to, um, I personally believe that implementing something like this or relying this on this would essentially be admitting defeat um, in terms of our ability to give application developers a transport that can give them end-to-end -end connectivity. Um, something like as simple as if I tell a remote peer what my IP address is, will it be correct? And w with NPTV6, you can't do this. So I think I, think I would much rather, uh, first of all, I don't think there's any, anything that needs to be done here. But I would also, if, if we do, I do agree that we have problems that we have not yet solved. Uh, network extension being one, which we are, believe it or not, hard at work on actually <laughs> in, in, our, in, in the ITF's inimitable way. But also I think multi-homing, um, I think we would be, for example, much better off um, pouring effort into implementing World 5.5 and getting sort of the, the multi-homing stuff that Jen has already published, implemented and, and used, right? I think, yes, there are cases that we still don't have an answer for, but I think we are not too far. And I don't think this is going to help because, yes, it might solve those cases, but a terrible price. I did not think that was violent at all. Thank you. <laughs> D disagreement is not violence. Sorry, Eric Vink here. No hat at all, so I don't have my cowboy hat compared to the chat. Um, 
when I saw this, I say, wow, I will violently but respectfully disagree, <laughs> right? But I think, yes, why not? It would be nice to ever propose alternate standards or propose a default solution or something like that. Doesn't exist, of course. So I don't object um, to move it forward. If you do move it forward, please add an implementation section to help approval later. Uh, David Lamparter, um, the one thing I'm concerned about with moving this to standards track is that it's going to end up on requirements lists for government entities, whatever, and it's actually going to prevent people or force them into implementing it even if they don't want to. And that is, the, for me, the, the concern that pushes me against wanting to put this in standard tracks. I'm okay with having the feature. I think this draft is... Uh, the, the, the experiment is enough to describe what you should do. And I'm, I'm loath to put it on standard tracks because I know people will require it and I don't want to be there. Yeah, I mean, this was an answer to the fact that um, IPv6 NAT was already on requirements lists uh, and that we did not want that to be implemented. And we said, if you must All implement right. this well, instead. We are really sort of out of time here. So let's get Nick and then I'm going to do a poll and then we'll move okay. on. Nick? Oh, there we go. So um, I think the, my point is really quick. Basically, like those requirements lists are already there. And for the most part, they do not consider what track the RFC right. says. They need a feature. They put it in an RFC. I've, or I'm sorry, they put it in an RFP. I've written a million RFPs to know that that is very often not considered at all. So I wouldn't be terribly concerned about that. Um, and that's really all I had to say. Okay, so starting a poll, we will con Seems like there's more support, but there is opposition. We, we will um, take this to the list. That, that seems you. reasonable. Thank you. Okay, Tom, so it's uh, in-flight removal of IPv6. Um, let's get your slides up and you can see if you can figure out if you have a pink box at home. Uh, there we go. I think the same thing applies to this presentation. So be gentler than necessary. This is a topic we have discussed before in all different flavors. Please go ahead, Tom. Okay. Uh, this is a new draft um, for removal of uh, hop by hop options and routing headers in flight. So I'm going to focus mostly for this presentation on the hop by hop options. Um, I'll mention the routing headers, uh, but the draft does cover both of these. Next slide, please. So the motivation for this starts with the drop rates of hop-by-hop -hop options. Um, as we talked about in the previous presentation I did, uh, there is APNIC data that was recently collected that shows pretty sobering results. Uh, the picture on the top, um, the all red for the whole world, shows that hop-by-hop -hop options are pretty much dropped uh, universally when they go out onto the internet. So the data is greater than 99% drop rate for hop by hop options. A picture on the bottom though is destination options, which clearly fare a lot better on the internet than hop by hop options. So that, that raises the first question is why are destination options um, looking better than hop by hop options? And I think RFC uh, 9098 uh, goes a little bit into that. Fundamentally hop by hop options target the infrastructure. So when we send hop by hop options, the intent is it's actually processed by routers in the network, not just the end host. And given the history of hop by hop options, going back to RFC 2460 and the requirements that all um, nodes have to process them, uh, the slow path uh, that resulted from them, 
I think what's happened uh, is pretty clear that hop, dropping hop by hop options is now a matter of policy uh, as opposed to capabilities or requirements. So that being said, I think it's unlikely that this situation will change anytime soon because we'd have to fundamentally change uh, the policy perspectives of all of the providers. Next slide, please. So with that, the um, question is, how do we move forward to make hop by hop options useful? So one of the things I would um, propose is that we assume hop by hop options really are only useful in limited domains. We, with those drop rates, it's unlikely we'll ever see hop by hop options that are universally uh, useful across the internet. So if we assume this, that hop by hop options are relegated to limited domains, then if routers of that limited domain process hop by hop options because they're providing a service like PathMTU or um, IOAM or one of those, that within that limited domain, they will make sure that hop by hop options are viable. So if they're providing the service and it kind of follows logically that they actually support them throughout the whole limited domain. So the question then becomes, how do we limit hop by hop options to limited domains? And again, this will also be applicable for uh, routing, routing headers, but the motivations are slightly different. So uh, again, I don't want to go into that. So there's two um, kind of rules of thought on this. The first one is have the sender not use hop by hop options if the packets, if it knows the packets are going to leave the limited domain. So the question then for the sender is how do you know that the hop by hop options are, are not useful or useful? So one, we could determine this by looking at the destination address prefix, which works if there's a prefix that identifies limited domain. Uh, in complex networks uh, at scale, this doesn't really work because it could be many prefixes in the limited domain. Uh, so there's a lot of um, complexity and scaling there. Uh, second one, um, we've proposed this before, do a sort of happy eyeballs probing. Uh, to see if the ex extension header is viable to the destination. I've come to believe this would force a lot of complexity into implementations. Um, we'd have to recreate hoppy eyeballs, but this one would be for extension headers. There's a lot of state that has to be tracked. It has to be bi-directional communication. Uh, thinking about all devices, especially low-end ones that would have to do this just for uh, using basically a, a feature that's in an internet standard, this seems like it would be uh, very costly um, and probably not feasible easily in implementation. Uh, the third one is if we get the information about viability from an external source, like routing protocols, uh, that would also be feasible. Uh, but the problem there is kind of the same thing. We now have to have hosts participate in routing protocols or add additional protocols. So this seems like a really difficult problem um, with not an immediate uh, feasible solution as far as I can tell. Next slide, please. So the other alternative, um, and this is usually brought up pretty quickly whenever we talk about um, compatibility with limited domains, why don't we just tunnel across a limited domain? The idea being when we tunnel, the out, outer headers could use things like hop by hop options. And then when packets leave the limited domain, we can remove the tunnel and the hop by hop options and send the original packet into the internet. So in principle that works, but that raises a few questions. So the first is if we do say an IP, IP encapsulation from a source with hop by hop options, how do we know what the destination um, address of the tunnel is? So this is tricky because in this case, we really want to know what the egress router address is for packets. Uh, hosts don't typically have this information. They might have it if it's, some, if it's a routing header, but in the case of just using generic hop by hop options, they would have no way to know if this packet's even going to go to an egress router, much less which one it is. And actually the network itself, if they're doing uh, sort of next hop routing, it wouldn't even know that even the first hop router wouldn't know what the ultimate destination is. So it's really difficult to find 
uh, what that destination is. Another proposal, uh, this was mentioned, I believe by Brian um, on the list, was why don't we encapsulate packets at egress? So a packet comes in to an egress router with hop by hop options, we could actually tunnel that um, without hop by hop options in the outer header to a destination on the internet, but then the problem becomes uh, we have to decapsulate uh, in all uh, host on the internet. In either case, um, the other issue with tunneling obviously is it does incur uh, fair, fairly significant overhead. So it's not, um, I believe a preferred solution. Next slide, please. So this uh, draft proposes that we allow routers in particular egress routers or ingress routers to remove hop by hop options and routing headers in flight. The benefits of this is packets um, that started with hop by hop options may in fact reach the destination. They wouldn't have them, but at least uh, we have communications established across the internet uh, as opposed to them being dropped. The hop by hop options actually would be applicable up until the point they're removed. So when we send a packet in a limited domain with hop by hop options, the hop by hop options would be applied uh, up until the point we hit, for instance, an egress router where they're removed. Also, th this is pretty efficient to implement. It's basically just a copy or we can use some scatter gather lists. I don't see um, that routers would have much difficulty implementing this. Next slide, please. So there are consequences. Um, RFC 8200 does clearly say not to do this. However, thinking about it, um, hop a hop options are already kind of best effort anyway uh, from RFC 8200. And more importantly, I haven't seen a case where this breaks anything. So correctness and the spirit of the law does seem to be maintained with removal. Hop by hop option removal can only, and routing header can only decrease packet size. So we shouldn't see any issues arising with uh, path MTU. The destination doesn't see hop by hop options. That's true. However, if the packet was dropped, um, they wouldn't see CD either. So kind of a tautology. Uh, ICMP errors wouldn't match what was sent. Uh, I don't think that's the worst problem in the world. We already have cases where that's that's true. ICMP errors for NAT uh, don't really work. And besides that, people tend not to accept ICMP uh, from the internet anyway. Uh, there's always a chance that bugs could allow packets through a configuration without the hop by hop option removed. That is a policy problem and configuration problem, um, not a problem of the protocol because it's uh, it's still correct to send hop by hop options uh, out of the limited domain. Next slide, please. Uh, so next steps. Uh, so this is pretty new. Uh, please comment. Um, I would like to do a POC. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, and possibly if there's interest, we can ask for working group adoption. Okay. I'm Jelinkova, no heads on. I just realized actually that there is a, another result of removing. You would never be able to measure hop by hop propagation anymore, right? Well, um, that that's true, right? But we don't have to remove. Um, you can certainly uh, do the measurements. There, there's no rule that says you ever have to remove. This is an optimization for traffic in practice. The other point I would point out, um, the term limited domain is fairly uh, broad here. So if we happen, if say we're dropping hop by hop options at an egress router and we happen to know that some destination does support hop by hop options and the path does, then we don't have to drop in that case. So logically we extend the limited domain to include that. And if vendors and, and providers do start to support them, then this gives us a path to incrementally add those uh, expand expand hop by hop options. So I don't think there's it's so inflexible that we couldn't do measurements or we couldn't have fallbacks. Uh, but this is just a I would view it as an optimization to try to make these um, hop by hop options more useful. Uh, just clarification. Currently, if I block them, you see it in the measurements. If I start removing them, it would look like I'm propagating them. So it might really look very very green on monitoring while it's actually not. And if you, okay, so I'm for the sake of time. There's, there's another thing here. Maybe um, we go to the next person in the queue. We're out of time. Nicola?
Hi. Oh. Hi, Nicola Lucignoli, Science Association. So um, I did not really uh, understand why you want to also remove the uh, routing options. And I think if you do that, you basically preclude any uh, interdomain use cases where you use uh, routing options. Um, and um, as far as I remember, these routing options are not dropped as much as help by help options. So I was wondering why is that? And well, um, I, think I, I think we might have a, a use case uh, for, so for that. So you're going to have to take, we'll have to take this to the list. We are out of time. So we All need right. to get to the last presentation. Yes, uh, please ask that on, on the list. Thank you. Yes, Paul. Hello, this is uh, Zhang Paul Zhang. Um, today, I want to introduce the basic support, uh, such as the IP bandwidth over 5G V2X. Next slide. Next, oh, on me, okay. So you can see uh, this figure shows uh, the 5G core uh, and radio access network architecture uh, to support the uh, 5G V2X. So the V2X means uh, pedestrian and the vehicle can communicate. Also the vehicle and drone and the vehicle, motorcycle, and the scooter, they can communicate each other. So in this scenario, you can see uh, nowadays you know, autonomous vehicle, electric vehicle, or scooter, or uh, many you know, smartphone users can communicate for some security or other infotainment services. So this is the um, abstract uh, vehicle network architecture. Uh, you can see the uh, 3GPP uh, 5G uh, network architecture, they support a multi-hub V2V uh, using by, uh, PC5 uh, reference point, which means the V2V uh, link. Also, vehicle to uh, infrastructure case, the vehicle and the GNODB can communicate. So we want to um, uh, clarify this kind of multi-hub uh, vehicle add-on network and infrastructure network uh, integration we should be considered. Next. Next, okay. Next slide. So uh, we needed to consider uh, a previous slide. Um, so um, you know, several things we need to consider for uh, IP six over 5G V2X. The first one is the uh, MTU, second is the uh, frame format and link local address and the subnet uh, structure and the Slack. So we needed to uh, clarify, uh, even though uh, 5G uh, uh, 3PP document um, uh, they specify something, but there is not a clear or uh, uh, some definition. We need to clarify. So MTU case, we just um, uh, can be used from um, IP wave, uh, such as uh, I, um, IP is over L to the 11 OCB uh, RPC, uh, we can reuse. And the frame format case, we uh, 3PP define the radio and uh, logical link layer and IP version 6, we can uh, take advantage of the format. And the link local case uh, we can uh, use, and also 3PP document are saying um, so. Depending on the situation, link local can be uh, the DDD can be uh, skipped. Structure case uh, you can see this figure shows a multi hub uh, vehicle add-on network case. So we should consider uh, certain cases the vehicle network case um, opaque uh, IID should be used. In that case, some conflict of interface ID. Uh, happen so we need to consider uh, certain uh, DAD um, from time to time. So the question is a uh, select case. You can see here this figure shows right car B A C D right. So D is not connected this vehicle add-on network. So uh, in the past uh, car D used the link local, but certain cases in the highway the car C and D is merged somehow. Uh, car D can get some prefix from uh, car C and then can configure. Uh, global IP or uh, unique uh, local IP uh, unique address. So we have you know uh, four questions here. Reserve, which means if you know the multiple vehicle uh, case, uh, some vehicle can uh, play a role of router. So in that case, which yeah, vehicle UE can be uh, the router. And the secondly, uh, uh, multiple IP address prefixes available for the vehicle add-on network. So how we can uh, select also which a node will be a router, so we need to uh, clarify. And uh, lastly, so um, you can see uh, if uh, the vehicle uh, car D case uh, doesn't have any connection, 
width only have a link local address. But in certain cases, uh, uh, in the middle, beaker can uh, attach and then multi-hub connectivity can be provided in that case how to handle this one. So um, current series PP, they don't consider multi-hub scenario, just uh, AMF, access and management function case, but single hub, um, uh, the mobility management is considered, but we need to consider uh, this. Um, I brought this one because uh, the IP wave case, uh, we clarified this problem, but we didn't um, make any extension IP version 6, but I want to uh, make uh, some uh, some draft. If this is uh, the valuable uh, working group, uh, I want to yeah work with you guys. Thank you. Any question or comment? Any comments? I'll encourage you to read the draft and comment on the list. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Yeah. Well, I think we are done. So thank you very much. Um, we're even a little early. So, and then it will have a session in Brisbane in next spring, I think. So fall, whenever it is. Well, it depends. But it's probably the spring in Brisbane. Oh, I the other way around. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.